and uh, very, very happy to have you with us here live. All right, well, can you, can you guys hear me? Is that all right? Yeah, we hear you perfectly. All right, sounds great. Well, I appreciate the, the chance to be with you and uh, apologies for the uh, not so great video. Uh, stuck in a, a hotel room in uh, California out here for the Milken Conference. So I am going to dive in and uh, then if there are questions at the end, we, we can address those. Um, so the title of the presentation is, is Beyond Blockchain, Welcome to the Metaverse. And you can see on the left-hand side here, uh, kind of description of, of what uh, is involved in the metaverse. There are a bunch of different things from, you know, the digitization of business to the exchange of, of capital and, and money, uh, cryptocurrencies, trading, all these things are, are, are going to make up our, our lifestyle in the metaverse as, as we get to it. And on the right-hand side, I just talk about this digital divide. There are digital natives and there are the rest of us, uh, the oldsters who are are still clinging to some of our, our common ideas uh, about what's happening uh, in the digital age. So just to start, a plan conceived in moderation must fail when circumstances are set in extremes. And, and we are at a point now where the circumstances uh, are certainly extreme versus what we all were used to in, in growing up in, in capital markets, in, in our daily lives. Uh, I'm coming to you digitally from halfway around the world. Uh, are, are perfect examples of that. Uh, and we always overestimate the change that will occur in the next two years and underestimate the change that will occur in the next 10. Don't let yourself be fooled into an action. In fact, I believe so much in this idea of, of being early to invest in change. That is my pinned tweet on Twitter, at Mark Yusko, for those who care. Uh, the greatest wealth is created by being an early investor in innovation. Making that investment requires believing in something before the majority of people even understand it. You'll be mocked, ridiculed, and criticized for your non-consensus action, but it is absolutely worth it. So a couple of points on, on change. So one of the secrets to change is to focus all of your energy, not on fighting the old, but on building the new. And that was all the way back from Socrates 2,600 years ago. When the winds of change blow, some people build walls, others build windmills. So we can either embrace it or we can fight it. The reasonable person adapts to the world. The unreasonable one persists in trying to change the world to themselves. Therefore, and I love this part, all progress depends on the unreasonable person. So it's up to us to, to be unreasonable in thinking about how we can bring the, the powers of the world around us uh, to our benefit. I believe you have to be willing to be misunderstood if you're going to innovate, from a guy, Jeff Bezos, who knows a little bit about innovation. And if I'd asked the public what they wanted, they would have said uh, a faster horse uh, from Henry Ford. Uh, the advancement of the arts from year to year taxes our credulity and seems to presage the arrival of that period when human improvement must end. Now, two things. One, I love the fact of how they talked in the 1800s. This was the head of the U.S. Patent Office, basically saying that everything that could be invented had been invented in 1843. Not so much. Don't be afraid to take big steps when indicated you can't cross the chasm in two small jumps. So let's just think about this. You know, early, early investors in innovation enjoy spectacular returns. So if you were an early investor, I'm oh, sorry, I went, I went too far. If you're an early investor in the telegraph, uh, you saw its value double in its first year, but really the big returns were, went up 11,000% over the next decade, as most people thought it was a fad. And you couldn't imagine being able to sit under a tree. And here's a forecast for, for the early 1900s of a woman sitting by herself re receiving an amorous message. I love that, probably looking at Instagram or something. And the guy on the right, you know, really unhappy because he just got the uh, results from the track, from the betting track. So as technology evolves, the incumbents don't like it and they will dismiss it as uh, unnecessary. So, you know, the telephone has many shortcomings to be seriously considered as any means of communication. That was from the president, shockingly, of Western Union. But my favorite was the Americans have need of a telephone, but we do not. We have plenty of messenger boys from the head of the British post office. Hmm, I guess we probably could use some... some uh, additional uh, innovation there. Henry Ford's lawyer missed the opportunity 
to invest in innovation and wipe out the American electric vehicle company. Most people don't realize that the largest company, car company in the United States in 1903 was an American or was an electric car company. Electric vehicle has been around for a very long time. Henry Ford basically put it on the shelf, bought up the technology, shelved uh, the competitor's technology, and we've had a pretty good run for a, a century in internal combustion engines. And maybe that comes to an end, maybe it doesn't. But it's interesting that it really wasn't innovative in the last few years. It was actually innovative back 100 years ago. But Henry Ford's lawyer said, the horse is here to stay. Automobile is a novelty or a fad. By the way, anytime something is called a fad, you should buy it with both hands. Math is hard. People can't do math very well. They can't imagine the unimaginable. Here, there's somebody basically saying, look, if you look at evolution, it'll take roughly 10 million years for a human being to fly. That was actually two months before the Wright brothers flew in North Carolina. Now, back in 1949, computers uh, became a thing and the, the company Digital Equipment Corp uh, was, was started and popular mechanics said, look, when a calculator like ENIAC is equipped with 18,000 vacuum tubes, weighs 30 tons, we can imagine a future in which a computer would only weigh 3,000 pounds. We did a little better than that. And Charles Darwin, pretty smart guy, said basically it's possible that one machine would suffice to solve all the problems in any country. So we need about 100 computers worldwide. You know, we're a few more than that today. Uh, when things are called a fad, like I said, you should buy them quickly. I've traveled the length and breadth of this country and talked with all the best people. I can assure you that data processing is a fad and won't last out the year. And here we are with a company called American Data Processing that has outdistanced the S&P 500 by a mile. Uh, and it's not even the best company in computing. Incumbents always misjudge innovation. They are threatened by the disruptors and they just can't imagine a world where they're not in charge. So 1926, why theoretically and technically television may be feasible, commercial and financial viability is just impossible. Impossible in 1926. Guess who said that? The father of radio. Shocking. Um, by 1946, it was, look, it, television might be able to hold on to a market, but only for about six months. People will get tired of staring at a box. Now we don't stare at a box. We, we stare at our hands with a phone in it. But the, the television companies couldn't even envision the competition that would come at them in the form of cable television or ultimately streaming. Imagine that, you know, the big three networks in the United States had all of the market cap uh, 50 years ago. Today, they have none, it's all Netflix. So uh, I love DEC. DEC was formed by a venture capitalist back in 1957 with $70,000. And 20 years later, Ken Olson, president said, look, there's no reason that anyone would want a computer in their house. And then 20 years later, he was bought by a personal computer company. I love that part. But look, even the best of the best, even the great ones, Okay, Bill Gates, left-hand side, no one would ever need more than 637K of memory. So 640 ought to be good for anybody. Now, these guys were pretty rough looking back in the 70s. I grew up in Seattle. I didn't go to work for these guys. Maybe you wouldn't blame me. A lot of my friends don't have to work anymore because they did. Um, but on the right-hand side, you can see the blue line. It's done a lot better. So if you had invested in that innovation, uh, you would have made a lot of money. So what makes blockchain technology so important. So Andy Grove talks about this, is that there are few skills as powerful as understanding when things change. But you don't get to wait until you have all the data. You have to make the actions with imperfect information. So being able to see these inflection points, and the way we think about inflection points is that they are this, this move along the S-curve of adoption where the next big thing becomes apparent. Now, in the early days, those things are labeled as fads, and we don't, we don't think they're going to be anything. In fact, uh, some of them do turn out to be the wrong horse and, and go back to zero. But ultimately, uh, if you see them when they happen and you choose to act, you have a chance to survive. Because the problem is most companies are faced with these strategic uh, change points, these inflection points, all throughout their, their lives. And they must adapt. And as Andy Gross said, it's not, if you're wrong, you'll die. But most companies don't die because they're wrong. 
they die because they don't commit themselves. They fritter away valuable resources in attempting to make a decision. You have to act with imperfect information. And the problem is it's not just once. This happens over and over again along this S-curve adoption. As we go from the formative phase with the innovators to the early adopters and sustained growth to ultimately a slowdown in maturation, but it doesn't happen once, it happens over and over. Now, within this S-curve wave of adoption, we are going through a series of long cycle evolutions or, or even revolutions. So in the 1800s to the early 1900s, it was all about converting muscle energy into mechanical power, right? They say that slavery actually was ended by the discovery of oil because you had 40 years, people years, of energy in a single barrel of oil. It was pretty amazing. And so you needed less people to do more work because of machines. And then we went to transportation and the energy revolution in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Then we went to the digital revolution, the electronic age, as we converted brain power ultimately into what we have today, artificial intelligence. So there've been these epics, the epic of steel, the epic of the automobile, the epic, epic of information and life and tech, uh, telecommunications. The next epic, which is right around the corner in 2024, is the blockchain era. And this, one of the most important slides in the deck is that the information age is evolving into the digital age as we come along this cognitive revolution, as we, use more of our brain and our intelligence and bring it into a merger with technology. So in 54, they invented the mainframe. 14 years later, the microchip. 14 years later, the personal computer. Why it's always 14 years, I haven't actually figured that part out. 14 years later was the internet. Uh, we, I was in, uh, investing at the University of Notre Dame at the time. We put half a million dollars in this little company called Google, turned into 200 million. There should be a quad at Notre Dame called the Google Quad. 14 years later, back in Seattle, where I grew up at, at Craig McCaw's house for his family office meeting, and I asked the guy there, you know, do you think the mobile net is going to be as big as the internet? He said, Mark, are you kidding me? Ask people if they want a computer, like whatever. Ask them if they want a phone. They have, yeah, I already have two. I don't need another one. So the mobile net, which totally transformed commerce, uh, was bigger than the internet. And blockchain era, which starts in 2024, is bigger than all of it. And it's all because of connections. Right? We're connected right now digitally. Everything is connected. In 1954, there were no connected computers. There were big mainframes that governments had, and they went into big business. And then we had client server technology in the 80s, and it was horrible, but, but it was better than nothing. In the future, okay, in five years, there'll be 200 billion connected devices from cars to phones to refrigerators. And all of those connected devices cannot run on cloud computing. They need a decentralized network. And this adoption happens faster and faster. It took 100 years for the telephone to get in 90% of uh, homes. It's still in some places in North Carolina. They don't have uh, indoor plumbing. So it takes a long time for certain technologies to drop to, to adopt. But if you look on the far right-hand side, you can see that things that we're doing today in the metaverse, in the digital world are happening faster and faster and it's because of the power of that technology. The problem is you need multiple inflection points for success. So if you look at the cover story of the failure of the internet, pets.com in 2000, everybody said, well, it's just a failure. Well, wait a minute, chewy.com. It's the same company. They do the same thing. It's just 20 years later. And what we needed, we needed broadband. We needed delivery technology. We needed GPS tracking. We needed all these things to allow the idea of pointing on a button on in a digital world and having physical goods deliver to our house a reality. Now, what's interesting, if you look at the 10 biggest equities in the world, five of those entities aren't companies the way we think about companies. They are networks. And networks are very, very valuable because they grow not linearly, but exponentially. And most people are just bad at math, like I said. And so the idea of doing exponential math or uh, uh, logarithmic regression is just really, really hard. But what Amazon, Microsoft, Apple, Google, Facebook, what they figured out is it's not about making money in the early days. It's about building your networks and getting more and more people and then monetizing those networks. And it's again, because of math. In the old world, 
You wanted to control things. You wanted to control equipment. You wanted to control property or people. In the new world, you want to control networks. And that's because of the right-hand side. Your costs grow linearly as you add new people, new staff, new machines, but your profits grow exponentially because of the elegance of the math behind the network effect. So Sarnoff's law says the value of the network decreases proportionally to the size of the network. But that was wrong. That just said it grew linearly. But Metcalf came along and said, no, it grows exponentially. It's the square of the number of users in the network because there are interconnections between all the nodes in the network. And then Reed's law came along and said, no, it's even faster than that because around the fringes of the network, you get sub-networks that start to exhibit the same factors. It's a reflexive process. And the reason it's so important, if I ask people, what's two times two? They'll say four, right? If I say what's 17 times 23, right? They'll say, I have no idea. That's the limit of human intelligence. People need a calculator to do that. If I say, how are you nonlinear regression? You know, probably not very good. And so if I take 10 linear, I'm sorry, 20 linear steps across the room, I get to the other side. If I take 20 exponential steps, I'd actually come get to give everybody in the room a high five twice. I go around the world twice. So we are investing at an inflection point, which means we need to back transformational technologies, technologies that really don't exist in their full form. And that's what's so difficult because we don't get all the information. And the problem is if you don't do it, you're gonna lose because every company in the world is being disrupted as we speak. Every industry is being disrupted. You think about the largest car company in the world, a tra large transportation company in the world. They don't own any cars. The largest hospitality company in the world doesn't own any hotel rooms, you know, Airbnb. So when you think about disruption, every business is going to be disrupted. Now, why should we be afraid of an accounting system, right? Ledgers have been around forever. We had clay tablets and we had papyrus and then we had these things, tally sticks. And in the olden days, if I wanted to borrow money or lend money, I kept a ledger. And if I lent somebody money, I wrote down how much they owed me. And they had to trust me that I wrote down the right amount. So the Medici's came along in 1300 and said, you know what? A single ledger is bad. We need a dual ledger, lower left-hand corner. And you write down how much you think Mark lent you, and he'll write down how much he lent you. And then we, for a fee, will be the middleman, and we will determine which ledger is right. So we will audit the ledger. And for years, for 700 years, they've had a pretty good run. But today, what blockchain technology does is allows us to have a distributed, permanent digital ledger. So we no longer need the middleman. And the reason it's better, if you think about centralized organizations, the whole world is built around centralized hierarchies. Why? Because we are trying to leverage the brain at the top. And if you think about that, that made a lot of sense. You had a lot of workers and they supported the, the upper management and they supported the senior management and they supported the executive management and they supported the person at the top, usually a white male. Um, and that was a great system for a long time until you realized that it was fault tolerant. It was attack and, and it was a vulnerable to attack and collusion. I'll give you a great example. So if you think about uh, song sharing, Napster, right? This guy came along, he coded up some stuff. He said, okay, I can take an analog piece of music. I can convert it to electronic form and I can make a copy and share it. You just hit copy, paste, send it off to somebody and I can share the music. Well, that's bad for who? It's bad for the music industry. So what did they do? They do what you always do to a architecturally centralized and politically centralized system. Think of one CEO, one home office. You arrest the CEO and you blow up his server, literally take a sledgehammer to it. But we have to think beyond that as to logically centralized and decentralized. As we go from centralized on the left to decentralized and distributed, we get this interconnectivity of nodes. And so I can be having a conversation with you, right? Right now in real time, 
And my son, who speaks two languages instead of one, can have a conversation in another language. We're still using the basic core concepts of language, but we're using them differently in different places at different times. And we have more optionality in how the world works. So what blockchain technology does simply is it establishes a single source of truth. And it's why I call this coming evolution, the trust net. And blockchain allows us to have a trust machine that gets rid of all of the middlemen and middlewomen that are in every industry. Every industry is going to be disrupted by blockchain technology, whether it's legal, whether it's voting. Imagine actually knowing who won the election the moment the election is over. We don't have to count votes. We would know every single person would have a single vote. It would be digitally encrypted and there would be no cheating, no extra votes, no stuffing ballot boxes and there'd be no fraud. How about provenance? How about if you're a company and you sell food and some of your food gets contaminated, should you recall all the food? Or how about just the food that was contaminated on the one farm? So we know provenance, supply chain issues. So we wouldn't have the, the disaster that's happening uh, a couple miles away here in Long Beach. So all kinds of things from insurance to healthcare, the thing about blockchain is it stores any type of information, health information, financial information, all information can be organized and stored digitally permanently and shared as a single source of truth. So I'll make a big statement. The blockchain era will usher in a period of unprecedented wealth creation. This is the biggest wealth creation opportunity we will see in our lifetimes. And it's because we are decentralizing trust. No longer do we have to rely on that trusted third party. And we will allow value to exchange without intermediaries. Just let that settle for a second and I'll come back to it. So what the internet did to media and commerce blockchain will do to financial services. So if you think about media, what was media? Media for, for ages, for millennia, right? The church controlled media, right? Because they were, they spoke from the pulpit. The printing press came and busted that monopoly. So then governments took over. And for centuries, governments were basically in control of information through state-owned media and other things. And media rose up to have a lot of power. Well, the internet busted that monopoly. Today, you don't get your news. If I want to know what's happening in the Argentinian election, I don't wait for a journalist to write a story, go through an editor with their biases, go into a media outlet with their biases. I actually go on Twitter and I watch a periscope of people in line at the polling place in Argentina to find out who the winner is going to be. So we have instant information at our fingertips. We are engaging in the digital world and the physical world as we move toward this, this metaverse. And the thing about it is media was big, right? Media is big. And we went from information being unidirectional outward to websites being created that allowed information to be bi-directional. So information is not singular and sourced by one person. It is bi-directional, it's community-based. And so what the internet did is it totally busted that monopoly and created massive wealth for media companies, new media companies. The second thing it did is commerce. It broke open forms of commerce from the general store to e-commerce, and that is still happening all around us. But those are small industries relative to financial services. Financial services is huge. The stock market is huge. The bond market is bigger. The currency market is bigger. The derivatives market is bigger, quadrillions of dollars. And that will all be disrupted by blockchain. In fact, WEF two years ago said that tech, blockchain technology would become the beating heart of a new financial system. Not just improving the old financial system, but creating a brand new financial system. Well, why do we need a new financial system? What about what's wrong with the old one? Well, the banks, they've been, like I said, they've had a pretty good run for 700 years, but they've been under attack for decades because of fintech. If you think about how you used to get your loan, right? you used to get your loan from a bank. Now you can get your loan online from a peer-to-peer -peer or a, uh, a lender like Rocket Mortgage. People don't use banks the same way they did. But here's the real problem. 40% of adults in the world, let that sit in for a second, don't have a bank account. 
but two thirds of those do have a mobile phone. So we can deliver financial services, banking services to the unbanked using distributed ledger technology, using digital technology, using blockchain technology. So the digital age ushers in massive, just massive opportunities to combine these four things, a distributed ledger, an immutable record, encrypted information and programmability in a trustless network that will improve liquidity, lower cost, it'll be more efficient and be more secure. So if you think about commerce, right? In the good old days or bad old days, if I wanted to exchange money for a stock, I had to take a physical piece of paper, I had to meet someone else with a physical piece of paper under the buttonwood tree up in New York, and we exchanged. And then people realized that on the way to the buttonwood tree, you could get mugged and robbed and people would steal your bearer asset. And so they figured, hey, let's move this indoor. So we created exchanges, places where people could go, but you still had to have physical pieces of paper. So then they said, well, no, we can go to the electronic age and we can take those physical pieces of paper. We'll house them in a place called DTCC. We'll take images of them or turn them into QCIPs, alphanumerics, and then people can be anywhere and exchange goods and services. We'll take money and we'll electronify it. We'll put it into ones and zeros in bank accounts instead of physical pieces of notes. Mon physical money is about 8% of money today. 92% uh, of it's electronic, but we're on the way to digital money. Why? Because digital securities, they have the lowest cost. They're truly global. You can be anywhere at any time of the day. The New York Stock Exchange is closed more hours than it's open. Banks are closed more hours than they're open. That doesn't make any sense. Why is it America's time versus world time or anybody's time? So what the digital world does is it allows us to own assets fractionally, digitally, anywhere around the world in a global borderless world. And why is that important? Well, it's important because 14 trillion, or the T, okay? Trillion here, trillion there, pretty soon we're talking real money. Remember, one trillion, a trillion, is a dollar every second for 31,710 years. It's a very, very large number. $14 trillion of stocks, bonds, currencies, commodities, trades every single year. But we're talking about the entirety of it. All $700 trillion of global assets, every stock, every bond, every currency, every commodity, every piece of art, every piece of real estate, every private business, every everything will be digital in the digital age. So let's start with the first application. So money, right? Money, right, has been physical. You had bare assets, piece of paper. And anytime money was based on commodities like gold or silver, it had a pretty good run. Anytime it was just paper, it was horrible. And, you know, three quarters of paper currencies have disappeared. The oldest, the pound sterling, used to get you one pound of sterling. Now it takes 174 pounds of sterling to get a pound note. So that's the devaluation of currency. And everybody says, well, you know, these things aren't currencies. They have nothing behind them. There's no intrinsic value. No currency has intrinsic value. Here in America, we use red, green pieces of paper. If you go to, you know, China, they use red pieces of paper. If you go to the UK, they use all different color pieces of paper. There's nothing behind fiat currency except for custom and belief. We have the belief that we can exchange for goods and services. And we have custom that we've done it in the past. And so the Lindy effect basically says, the longer you survive, the longer you will survive. So when people think about life expectancy, they think, oh, people are living longer. No, that's not it. It's people aren't dying as young, right? So we have lower infant mortality in the developed world. So your life expectancy goes up. Now we do improve life and people are living genetically longer, but the reality is by decreasing the mortality at the front end, it gives anything a longer life, whether it's technology or human beings. And Bitcoin is an example of an application of blockchain technology to the real world in terms of it is a better money. Gold has been money for 5,000 years. One ounce has bought a fine person suit for 5,000 years, from a suit of armor to a zoot suit to a fine suit on Savile Row. One ounce has been a perfect store of value. But now we have something that's better than gold because it's more divisible, it's more portable. Think about carrying bars of gold through the airport, really hard. I can carry Bitcoin on my phone. So investing in crypto and Bitcoin, it's like being in 1996. It's literally like being at Notre Dame in 1996 and being able to invest in Google and eBay and Yahoo. 
and the opportunity set was massive. And that's because network value isn't linear. It goes parabolically along this S-curve of adoption. And we are in the frenzy phase. We're just in the very beginning stages of adoption of these assets. And so everybody's talking about what's happening with Bitcoin or where it's going or what. The reality is it's following this curve, this red curve that's done in 2014. And it basically says, based on Metcalf's law, the value of the network, it should go from 1,000 to 10,000 to 100,000. That's a log scale. And this is the path that is fine. But the green line, is the price and price is a liar. The daily price of these assets doesn't matter at all. What matters is accumulating ownership of these networks. Another way to look at it is comparing it to gold. Gold has been this store of value forever. It's been a, the most scarce asset. Well, because Bitcoin has a limited supply and a limited number of new Bitcoin created every year, it has greater scarcity. It is the scarcest asset on the planet. So if we think about uh, this development over time, again, log scale, and the line basically gives you a sense of in the upper right-hand side is real estate in red, and then you've got gold, and you've got silver, and you've got diamonds. And these are the assets that have been stores of value for most of the last millennia. But now Bitcoin has come along and used technology to merge the physical world and the digital world in a unique way. And so the media narrative would say it's over, but the reality is, I don't like the term perfect storm because that implies negative. Marky Mark went down with the ship. This is actually the inverse of the perfect storm. All the things from the idiocy of modern monetary theory or modern monopoly money theory to the aging demographic, to the rise of the millennials, to uh, election concerns, to all these things say that we need sound money. And we're so early. There are individuals that have as much wealth as some uh, of the elements of cryptocurrency. And so we're only at a couple trillion dollars on our way, probably to gold equivalents would be eight trillion. And then ultimately central bank currencies around the world should be about 80 trillion. And the institutions are coming. And when they come, it will be a great wall of money. So in 2020, Bitcoin was the best performing asset again this year. If you ask people what's the best for me, they say, oh, stocks. Stocks aren't even close, right? I mean, it's 20% to, to over 100%, not close. And the reason is, again, back to networks. The network value of Bitcoin today is roughly equivalent to the other networks, the other fangs. But ultimately, we're going to gold's value, monetary value of $4 trillion, up from $1 trillion today. That's a 4x. Then we go to the total value of gold, which is about $8 trillion. So it's about an 8x from here. And if just perhaps we take on all global currency, which is possible, it'd be 100x from here. Shouldn't you have some exposure to that? People like Michael Saylor would say so. People like Jack at, at, uh, at Twitter would say so. So all these people are square are buying as much of these assets as they possibly can. And in fact, for investors, the world is changing. We all know that if you add an uncorrelated asset to your portfolio, things get better. Well, Bitcoin is the most uncorrelated asset of all uncorrelated assets because it doesn't get its returns from the same thing as stocks and bonds. Stocks and bonds, corporate profits, economic growth, interest rates. If you think about crypto assets, it's all about investor adoption. It's about millennial growth. It's about the networks. It's about technology itself. If you'd taken 1% five years ago, out of stocks and bonds, put in your portfolio, your portfolio would have made 200 basis points more. The cool part is that if it had gone to zero, which was unlikely, but if it had gone to zero, you still would have made 7% instead of 7.2. So that's a 10 to one upside downside, 20 basis points of downside, 200 basis points of upside. Amazing. So ignoring it just isn't gonna work. There's a story about the, the ostrich on the savannah, the lion comes out of the bush, the ostrich turns his back, lays his head on the ground, pretends the lion can't see him. It's a wives tale. They actually don't bury their head. Um, and so the lion still eats the ostrich. The ostrich just doesn't see it happen. So traditional finance. So we all work in traditional finance. That is now migrating to what we call centralized finance. So that's the adoption of this decentralized approach of crypto cryptographically secure assets in platforms where we can trust somebody. 
right? We don't want to manage all the technology ourselves. So we use companies like Coinbase or BlockFi or Celsius Network. All these companies are essentially centralized resources that help us toward the ultimate goal, which is decentralized finance, where we don't need that trusted third party, where we actually, the community, engage in finance. Now, not every financial service needs to be decentralized, but the vast majority do. And so there is a protocol layer that is occurring in DeFi that is emerging just like the protocols did in the internet. If you think about the internet, right? We have five protocols that we use all the time. We have TCP IP at the base layer that you and I are using right now uh, to talk. Then you've got uh, FTP to transfer files. You've got SMTP to do emails and HTTP to do websites. And then www that ties it all together. In the emerging world of the digital world, we have Bitcoin as a base layer. We probably have Filecoin to manage files. And then on the top, we have Ethereum to put everything together. And then there's some competing things in the middle that will help us do all of these other things in that protocol call stack the same way the internet protocol stack works. So if you think about the history of DeFi, it's pretty young, right? It only really got started about five, six years ago, but the progress has been amazing. And I used to say that it was like the national anthem just played for a, for a match. And someone said, no, Mark, it's like the players are just entering the stadium. So it's so, so early. Now, as we think about the metaverse. So the metaverse is a digital world where participants work, transact, and socialize. And why does it matter? Well, it matters because if we think about how we are all connected, how this real world, world connectivity is migrating into the digital connectivity, you think of it as literally two worlds coming together and overlapping, a Venn diagram of the physical world and the digital world and where we see things that, uh, whether it's immersion in video games, whether it's uh, you know, doing 3D rendering of, of new concepts and, and seeing them in, in uh, augmented reality or virtual reality. All of those things are a blending of the physical and the digital world. And it's all critical. And it was, it was laid out in, in this book uh, called Snow Crash. And it talks about that there are seven primary attributes uh, that define the metaverse and, and kind of tell us how this transition to the digital age is going to happen. So one is persistence. It's, it's always there. It's always on. And it doesn't need to rest, right? The physical world, right, we have to recharge our cars and we have to, you know, power down our, our buildings and, and uh, save, save energy. We have to renew things. But, but the, the metaverse really doesn't end. And it operates continually. Synchronicity uh, is basically a living experience. Everybody that engages with the metaverse changes the metaverse. And that symbiotic relationship basically says that people can take from the, the metaverse itself, but also give back to it and make it better in real time. Accessibility. So any event, any place, uh, anyone can participate really with, with no restrictions on concurrent participation. You can be doing multiple things at multiple times in the metaverse, like you physically have to be present in one place, right? I can either go here or I can go there. But in the metaverse, you can actually multitask, which is really interesting. Economic function. So if we think about uh, how we all interact in the real world, whether it's individually or businesses, we have to create, we have to own assets, we have to sell assets, we have to exchange services for value. And what the digital age does is it allows us to make value bi-directional. The same way that the internet made information bi-directional, what this does is it makes uh, value bi-directional. So the scope, uh, it spans every network in the world, whether it's public, whether it's private, whether it's digital, whether it's physical, and it will be 
engaging both open and closed networks. So the people that want to have their own networks will suddenly find themselves engulfed, surrounded by the metaverse. Interoperability basically says that it's going to take time for things that started in one place to be able to be used in another place. You know, one of the most important companies uh, out there, actually my son actually works for him, called Snowflake, they figure out ways to make your data interoperable. Like that you collect data from one group and another group and you need it to talk to each other and they help with that. Think about as this, a Fortnite gun. People earn these, these big guns or skins in Fortnite, but they want to transfer it uh, and, and give it to somebody in another part of the world like Facebook. And then contribution. Uh, it's all about who contributes and the more you contribute, the more you're rewarded. So in the current system, the power, the elite, take the spoils, right? People work and work and work and work and either through inflation, the stealth wealth tax or other forms of taxation, uh, their assets are consumed by the power at the top. Here, the creators get to own their creations. Last night, like coming home from, I actually stayed out late, went to Rolling Stones concert, which was amazing by the way, and uh, came home in a Lyft. Well, why should Lyft get 30% of that ride fare for writing code five, six years ago? Now look, I'm a big investor in Lyft. I love the fact that they exist, but there can be a decentralized version of that in the future where we, the participants, the creators, the you know, riders and the drivers share in that instead of somebody creating the code. And the development will be done in the metaverse for free in an open source world. So the metaverse builds outward from the core. First, we have to do the infrastructure and that's true of anything. We have to set up the infrastructure and that is everything from 5G to Wi-Fi. I mean, think of autonomous driving, right? Autonomous driving is great until you think about being on a cell phone and having your call drop. If you're on a call, it's no big deal, right? You can just call them back. But if you're in a car and that car is dependent on the network to get you someplace without crashing, you can't have dead spots. You have to have full blanket Wi-Fi mesh. And so as we perfect the infrastructure, we can then move out uh, into the interface and the metaverse interface will be, uh, whether it's our mobile phone or whether it's smart glasses or gesture, or you know, I can move things or, or you know, Elon wants to put us uh, a neural network. Not sure I'm ready for that. Uh, then there's this idea of decentralization and why decentralization is more important than centralization. Decentralization is of the people for the people. Centralization is for the elite, for the powerful. So we're moving to a decentralized world where the power is moving down into the members of the metaverse. We need spatial computing, right? We need to be able to multitask in, in three dimensions, whether that's VR or AR. Uh, we need the tools and the marketplaces to allow for this creator economy. And you're starting to see examples of that, which we'll talk about in a second. Then comes discovery, right? Which is how do we find things in the metaverse? How do we know what piece of land to go buy? How do we know, or virtual land? How do we know what service to consume or what content to consume? And that's how everything works. It's right about getting your attention. Um, but in the future, in the metaverse, you'll be paid for your attention as opposed to Zuckerberg taking all the money. And then there's finally the experience. The experience itself is ultimately what will drive this. And I heard a great stat uh, yesterday. I saw the, the, the president of AMC Theaters was speaking and he was talking about the, you know, the whole meme stock phenomenon. And, and one of the things he said that I thought was amazing, he said that if you added up all the baseball games in the uh, M MLB, all of them, 162 games across all the teams, added all the games for football, all the games for basketball, all the games for hockey, put them all together. Movie theaters sell seven times more tickets. P 
people love that engagement, that experience of the theater. So he said the idea that, that we were just going to die and go away was was kind of pretty silly. Now, do we have a rough patch? Absolutely. We're on the verge of bankruptcy five times? Absolutely. The fact that we could then raise enough money to be in the incredible position they're in today came from this experience being valued by the members of the community. And what's really cool about the story is he went from being owned 80% by institutions to now 90% by individuals. Four million individuals, right? The Redditors and and the apes, uh, and they have deemed that this is an experience provider worth uh, keeping to be part of this metaverse. So the core elements are virtualization, democratization, decentralization, and identity. One of the things that's important in how we interact in the world is, again, in the physical world, right? You're physically present with somebody. You can, you can see them. You can, you can experience and, and, and verify their, their identity. In the virtual world, we have to make sure that we're interacting with the right people or persons. And so virtual identity is, is critically important. Uh, second is, is democratization, whether it's democratization of commerce or democratization of access or basically making goods and services and experiences available to the masses. There's this decentralization. Remember, that goes back to the fact that decentralized is more secure. It's less attack uh, vulnerable. It's, it's more resilient and it's more fair. It's more beneficial to the, the broader uh, economy. I'll give you a great example of this. So how does the metaverse make the world a better place? So think about virtual worlds, spatial software, gaming, uh, things like Fortnite. Okay, everybody knows what Fortnite is. It's a big company, big game. Everybody plays it. All the kids play it. And, you know, guess what? Niantic, I'm sorry, Niantic, Epic Games gets all the money. Centralized company. So people buy stuff in the metaverse. They exchange real fiat money for virtual dollars or virtual goods. And, you know, Epic makes a lot of money. So there's another company called Niantic that makes Pokemon Go, walk around virtual re augmented reality, catching little monsters and getting rewards, put in real money. So this company came along in, in the decentralized world and said, you know, if we did that in a decentralized world, we would all share in the revenues. Instead of it all going to Niantic or Epic Games, let's create it. So they created this thing called Axie Infinity. And over the past couple of years, today, it now grosses more in a year than Fortnite. Absolutely unbelievable. One of my favorite parts is you can take migrant farm laborers in Southeast Asia that were making a dollar a day. There are people that now hire them for $50 a day to play the game and convert their time into value, right, by earning these axes. But then some of those people actually accumulated enough money to buy axes themselves and breed them and, again, convert their time into value. Now they're making tens of thousands of dollars. Their world is better. Their life is better. The economy of the metaverse is better. The value of the network is rising as the increasing number of people learn about it and hear about it. And it's a really amazing way to push back down the wealth and in income inequality that's been created by the fiat world in this, this new world of the metaverse. Biggest concept we'll talk about, and, and then I'll let you guys go, which is tokens. I saw a clip of myself, 2018, when I formed Morgan Creek Digital. So Morgan Creek Capital is an asset management firm that I formed back in 2004 and love that. Uh, so my chapter one, right, I work for not-for-profits at uh, my own moderate Notre Dame and then for North Carolina. For chapter two, I built Morgan Creek Capital Management, which, you know, does asset management in, in innovation primarily, things like venture capital and hedge funds. Uh, but in 2018, formed Morgan, or 2017, 2018, formed Morgan Creek Digital. And I was on television and I think uh, Maria Bartirome asked me, you know, why are you so excited about this and what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to spend the next two decades tokenizing the world. What does that mean? So my chapter three is all about digital, all about the metaverse, all about decentralization, and all about tokens. Tokens are the ability to establish digital property rights for all assets. And I love this quote from Eric Schmidt, who knows 
thing or two about technology. Bitcoin is a remarkable cryptographic achievement. The ability to create something that is not duplicable in the digital world has enormous value. A lot of significant companies will be built around this idea. So what Satoshi Nakamoto, whoever he, she, they are, did is they created the ability to have property rights for any asset in the world uniquely, right? If I have a physical dollar and I turn it into an electronic dollar, in the old world, pre-Satoshi, I could make a copy of that dollar and I could send it. And if you got the copy, you didn't really care because it looked like a dollar, spent like a dollar, but the world cared because now I'm committing fraud. It's kind of what the central banks do every day. They just create dollars out of nothing. So in the digital world, I can't, if I have a Bitcoin, I can't create another Bitcoin. I have to send that Bitcoin to someone in the network and they receive that Bitcoin and the network says, yes, that Bitcoin, that value has exchanged. And so non-fungible tokens are an example of anything of value, whether it's gaming, whether it's music. Imagine playing a game like Axie Infinity for hours and hours and hours and having value and now being able to capture that value by selling the goods or the, the axes in the game or working really hard to be one of the best at a certain area and collecting all of these you know, rewards and selling those in the metaverse. Whether it's sports or you know, people owning their, their image and likeness now, uh, turning these into tokens that anyone can own or exchange is a monster innovation. There will be, there are 1.7 billion websites today. That's what defines the internet. There will be orders of magnitude more tokens in the future. So the intersection of DeFi and commerce within the metaverse is a pervasive trend that is not going away. So what we're going to see is the development of these protocols, these layer ones and layer twos and you, know, you think about people now can send Bitcoin anywhere around the world using the Lightning Network instantaneously for free using the Strike app. Truly amazing. Full disclosure, we're investors there. Um, and as we think about the, what we talked about in, in the DeFi world, all of these opportunities to move financial services from the analog and electronic world to the digital world are going to go across these protocol rails that will define the future of the metaverse. Community governance and ultimately investing or exchanging of value is the biggest opportunity in the metaverse today. So whether it's social tokens or DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations, or converting ownership of LLCs into DAOs, or whether it's uh, indexation or active management, all of the exchange of value in a global 24 seven borderless world in a decentralized uh, metaverse is, is ultimately what this is all about. So there are lots of companies that have emerged as leaders in the metaverse. Here's, here's 90 of them, 90 plus. And it's again, everything from marketplaces to virtual worlds, to virtual assets, to the hardware and software to make it to make it function. And all of these companies, remember, coming starting from the infrastructure, building out ultimately to the experiences, incredible, incredible investment opportunities. Now, existing companies adapt or die. So there are lots of examples of brands today using the metaverse, whether it's virtual stores where you can have virtual showrooms and try things on or, or, or create new products, whether it's sales training, right? Showing people how to be better salespeople in real time, whether it's analytics and data or customizers. Uh, how about product testing? You can send different uh, examples of a product to different users in the metaverse. So you don't have to actually manufacture a bunch of blue shoes and a bunch of red shoes. You can decide which one people like before you send it out. So you can do proof of concept. Uh, gamified commerce. This is a really interesting uh, development in that experiences and, and how we exchange value 
will ultimately be gamified. And that's a little bit like GameStop and AMC, people sitting at home, you know, trading, trading those tickers. Um, because when a stock trades, you know, four times all of their stocks outstanding in, in a day, that's not investing, that's speculating and gambling, but it's a gamification of commerce and real money is being exchanged and made and lost. Um, and ultimately, uh, the gamification of uh, businesses like Louis Vuitton, which basically created a way for users to go around and engage with the world to accumulate points to win uh, discounts, which you need a lot of uh, to buy a Louis Vuitton. Uh, but, but a really exciting way. And look, if you don't adapt, you die and you'll get displaced uh, by the disruptors. All right. So that is the end of my remarks. And I'm happy to take a couple questions if people have them or stop there. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, I will ask if there's a few questions for Mark. We'll be happy to take them. Uh, Mark, I have one question for you. How do we get the world to adopt and adapt the metaverse and everything that it contains? I know you have transferred or you have you have had a, a change in your career that has gone this direction, but lots of people seem to go the other way. Do you have a, 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 an idea for how that's going to change back? You know, I, I think change is, is always slow and then all at once. It's like they asked, you know, uh, Somebody wants, you know, how they went bankrupt and they just went slowly and, and then all at once. So I, I do think that like all technological innovation, they're going to be the early adopters. They're going to be the influencers. And, and one way that we, you know, increase adoption of anything is to get more influencers. And there are more influencers than ever today uh, engaged. And the fact that many of those influencers are already deeply part of the metaverse uh, I think that will, will increase its engagement. Look, the incumbents are going to fight really hard. Look what the banks are doing today to try to slow uh, cryptocurrency, right? They're trying to throw up regulation. They're trying to throw up uh, the FUD, the fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And that's been true for millennia, right? The incumbents will always try to slow the innovation. But ultimately, I ask every people all the time, name a technology, that got to the point of critical mass in terms of the network effect, that got put back in the bottle, right? You can't put the genie back in the bottle. So I think adoption will, will come from the bottom. I think it will come from the digital natives, the young. I think it will come from uh, the, uh, how should I say, the less elite in the sense of the, the people at the top they really don't want this, right? They're very happy having the system they have where they're dominant and they have a, an ability through inflation and the devaluation of fiat currencies to steal the wealth of the masses. So I think the metaverse is the, the, the karmic response, I guess, if you will, of taking these advances in technology and, and, and righting these, these wrongs of, of, of global society uh, over the years. And, and that's pretty cool. It's, 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 uh, the thing I get excited about is if you're a creator, you now own your content. You have the ability to distribute. How about, a, you know, I, I, I met this guy uh, for lunch the other day that I just met on Twitter. He's a, a rapper from the UK and he's a big influencer and written a couple books and a big public speaker. And uh, we connected through the metaverse. We get together in the physical world, share lunch and ideas. And, you know, he sells his music directly. So he doesn't have a label. He doesn't have to share uh, a big chunk of, of his royalties with, with uh, people who, you know, were in the world of, of promotion. And uh, that promotion can now happen peer to peer uh, through the engagement of the communities. And I think that adoption will just continue to uh, rise up from, from the bottom. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we see it at TD5 every day when we engage with new companies, that innovation is the key to moving forward. We have another question here. Hang on. Mark, uh, thanks so much. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, super. Thanks so much for that presentation. Very interesting. Mark, you, you guys run a number of funds and products in your uh, at Morgan Creek 
Morgan Creek Capital. Can you give, um, give us perhaps a flavor of what kind of returns you're chasing? Um, you know, I'm, I have traditionally followed you for a number of years, and I've seen, uh, you know, the, uh, the different products that you, I've also invested in some of your prior products that you actually had. And uh, um, can you uh, tell me in your, in your digital fund, what kind of returns yeah. you chase there? Uh, how do you benchmark that um, to perhaps your Bitcoin fund? Obviously, that's been stratospheric. How you, how you benchmark that to your venture fund and to your SPAC fund? And then, of course, maybe to your long, short uh, um, hedge fund that you have as well. Oh, wow. I, I one, thank you. I, I am, I am, uh, I'm humbled that uh, you know so much about us. And I love how the global village is, is true uh, in that, again, here we are halfway around the world and, and uh, you have familiarity with us and, and, and what we do. So, so thank you for that. So the, the, the quick history of Morgan Creek is, you know, I, I came out of the endowment world. I, I built an asset management business around access to alternatives, for lack of a better term. So hedge funds, hedge fund of funds. Uh, and from that, uh, we've went into venture capital and, and ultimately um, um, regional uh, growth equity. Uh, we have a, a China fund and and some, some tech funds in, in the US. And from that, we built a, what I call a culture of co-investment. And, and through that process over the years, uh, we backed a lot of really talented players. I was exposed to a group called Pantera. Uh, Dan Moorhead, a good friend, introduced me to the concept of, of digital assets eight years ago. I wasn't smart enough to figure it out for the first couple of years and actually got a lot of pushback from clients when we talked about it in 2013, 14, 15. Uh, but starting in kind of 2016, we started to build out our current expertise. So we formed Morgan Creek Digital. We run a venture capital fund. So that fund does early stage investing in infrastructure around uh, the metaverse. So everything involved with, with digital assets from exchanges to software to tools. In those funds, 30%, 3-0, is in liquid protocols. So things like Bitcoin or Ethereum or the Graph or Solana or other things like that. From that, we heard from clients, well, the private and stuff is interesting, but could you help us with the liquid protocols? So we set up two vehicles, one that does uh, a, a, basically an index fund of digital assets called the Digital Asset Index Fund, not a very creative name. And we also set up uh, a year ago, a Bitcoin risk managed fund, because one of the things that, that people were concerned about was the volatility of Bitcoin. Now I actually have a t-shirt that says embrace volatility and you know volatility is your friend. You want to own volatile assets with high asymmetric upside returns particularly if they're uncorrelated with other assets, which is why Bitcoin is so great. But there were people afraid of volatility, so we created a, a lower volatility way to, to invest. So if you think about those three products, you know the Bitcoin fund, we benchmarked two Bitcoin. So that's just a, a simple, uh, the index vehicle of digital assets, we benchmark against the, the top 10 by market cap, just like you would any other index. In the venture fund, we, we benchmark against venture capital broadly, not just venture capital and digital assets. And we've had two funds, one in 2018, one in 2020. We're raising a third fund today. Our first two funds actually today sit at the top 5% uh, of all venture funds uh, in their vintage in 18 and 20. So, so those have done, done pretty nicely. And that's just because we backed some great entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs at, at uh, BlockFi, uh, a great organization. Uh, we own a little bit of Coinbase. I was actually out last night with Yoni from, from uh, eToro, another one of our investments. So we try to back, you know, really great entrepreneurs and, and partner with them for, for, for the long term. Uh, last thing we're, we're focused on today is we are looking at uh, more active strategies in, in the, the digital asset space. And that would include areas like uh, play to earn, which is the, the gaming, uh, would include 
um, some of the other things that are, that are focused on the metaverse that are still in development. Um, you know, if you think about the infrastructure plays first, then the decentralized finance plays, and then these metaverse plays, that's kind of the evolution. So, uh, and then on our, our traditional stuff, you know, our hedge fund of funds, we benchmark against equities. Uh, our venture funds, we venture, uh, benchmark against uh, venture capital and, and the growth equity the same way. But, but I appreciate the, the very informed and, and, and great question. And uh, said so we've migrated our business over time to be increasingly digital. In fact, I guess I need to update my background to say Morgan Creek digital. Um, but uh, it's, it's an exciting time to be an investor in this space uh, because of everything that's going on. Thank you, Mark. Any other questions? One more, hang on. Hi, Mark. Th thanks very much hey. for that fascinating uh, presentation. Um, you mentioned a couple of uh, quite topical brands in the NFT space. You talked about, about Axie Infinity, and it was amazing to hear some of the successes you've had in, in previous investment ventures. What do you think about um, the kind of investment timeline for the metaverse? And, do you have any opinions or comments on the the kind of um, life cycle that some of these apps or games or businesses might have? And and is that something that comes into your mind when you're evaluating the risk of, of some of these investments or the opportunity? Yeah, look, that's, that's a fantastic question that I, I did not do a good job speaking to. If you remember the, the S-curve slide I had, in the middle of that S curve, right after the frenzy portion, there's something called the bust. And if you think about every technological evolution, you, they, they begin on those dates that I talked about, 1954, the mainframe, 68, the microchip, uh, 82, the personal computer, 96, the internet, 2010, the mobile net, and 2024, the trust net. Well, the, the big part of the momentum, that frenzy stage lasts about four years. And then you get a bust. So if you go back to you know the the early '60s, there was a, I mean the late '50s, there was a bust. If you go back to you know '72, '73, there was a bust. If you go to 2000, after the '96 wave, there was a bust. And that life cycle that you talk about is is really important. Is well, if you're too early and you invest in these trends uh, in that frenzy period coming up to the bust, many of them won't survive. And, you know, uh, pets.com is a great example of that. But what comes from that bust in terms of the life cycle, as you said, is the new businesses build on the survivors uh, of that, that inflection point. Remember that series of inflection points I talked about and how the great companies took advantage. Think about Apple, right? When Apple released their iPhone in 2007, stock went down 40%. Because we said no one ever pay five hundred dollars for a phone. Now we pay you know almost three times that. But you had to be convinced that you needed the features of of a smartphone over you know your flip phone that everybody thought was totally fine to make a phone call. But you don't make phone calls. These are supercomputers that we walk around with in our hand. And so there is a life cycle of innovation. There's a life cycle of accretive innovation on top of, of the previous layers. And it's that second wave opportunity. So I, I don't want to say that you shouldn't invest now, wait for the bust and then, you know, back up the truck because there are great opportunities in those early waves. They're just, they're just harder, right? It, it's, you know, you look at, there are thousands of, of tokens out there, uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, actually there are, there are 12 cryptocurrencies and there are thousands of, of utility tokens. Most of those utility tokens literally will go to zero because they're simply crowdsourced venture capital projects. And the loss ratio on early stage venture is, is very, very high. But the ones that don't go to zero, the ones like the graph or Solana that actually become something, you don't make five or 10%, you make five, 10, 50, 100 times your money. So in terms of how you think about investing in the life cycle, you want to manage that, that downside risk 
through position sizing. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Have a basket full of a lot of eggs. And actually, believe it or not, you want some of those eggs to crack and break. You want some of your investments to go to zero because that means you're taking the right risk profile to get the 20, 50, 100x returns. So I think about the returns we had in, in a company like BlockFi that you know we invested in a $20 million valuation and today is valued at $4 billion. That's really exciting. And that makes up for the seven or eight that we invested at you know million dollar valuations or five million dollar valuations that literally went to zero because they got out competed or or out engineered, and so investing in early stage technology is about uh, making lots of small bets, doubling up, right? Maybe the most important skill of any investor is most people want to double down. They want to prove that they're right, and so they. They you know, keep feeding their losers, terrible investment strategy. What you wanna do is you know, write off your losers, take the losses early and, and back your, your, your winners and feed your winners. The last part of that is if we think about that, that life cycle of a four year cycle. So 2024 is the emergence of the, the trust net. So we're gonna have a four year cycle, most likely from 24, 2024 to 2028 where we'll see just incredible opportunities, incredible innovation, incredible wealth creation. Then there'll be a shakeout. And I think it'll shake out the same way that the internet shook out. If you think about 96 to 2000, the great investments were the infrastructure, right? We made tons of money in eBay, in Google, in Yahoo, in the companies that were laying the infrastructure. Then we had the crash. Remember, Amazon in 2001 went down 94%. Down 94%. Who kept it? Nobody. Well, I would say the only people that bought Amazon at the IPO and have held it to today, it's an 80 vol asset, same volatility as Bitcoin. The only people that bought it at the IPO and held it today are Jeff, his mom, his dad, and his ex-wife. That's it. Everybody else got shaken out by that volatility, particularly that big volatility in the post-tech boom post-internet boom crash from 2000 to 2002. But what got built on the other side were companies like Apple, like Amazon, like Netflix. Netflix almost went bankrupt twice because their early model was terrible. First they sent disks, that was horrible. Then they tried video on demand, but it took four days to download a video. No one's gonna wait four days to download a video. So it wasn't until broadband came around that they actually had a chance to become a dominant superpower player. So it's that application layer on top of the protocol layers that is probably still a few years out and where a lot of wealth creation opportunities are gonna be. But it's, it's a really important question uh, to think about. So infrastructure first, remember that seven layers that I talked about. You start with the infrastructure, then you build out and ultimately it's the applications and the experiences uh, that, that create the most wealth, but they build on, on the infrastructure. Thank you, Mark. Um, I believe we have one more question for you. If you have another couple of minutes, maybe. Sure. That, that I, I'm just blown away that we're having a live conversation halfway around the world. Hey, Mark, uh, can you actually see us? Uh, I can. Oh, wow. I, I, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm going to be tweeting out a picture of us, uh, uh as we're talking a little right, bit later. Cool. So. Brilliant, brilliant. Okay, listen, I want to ask you a question. You've, um, as, as an investor, how do you approach, I mean, this is, perhaps this is a bit of a philosophical question. You know, I understand the concept of diversification and all of these various things. But, um, you know, when you look at, uh, when you look at projects, okay, we see uh, people will, a typical venture capital fund will pitch a whole bunch of projects. It's, it's fading in and out. I heard something about when I look at projects. I'll repeat myself. I'll, I'll repeat myself. So, okay, you've, uh, let's, let's, take the, let's take the idea of a venture capital fund that is investing in digital uh, companies, digital assets, okay? And um, Okay, so I, I heard when I'm looking at projects, particularly in the venture capital fund, and then, so, then I lost the last part. So, okay, so let's take an example like your fund, which 
uh, presumably invested in BlockFi, eToro, and uh, Coinbase, I think you mentioned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Obviously, um, two of them have done very well. Uh, oh, so what, 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 uh, how, do you, how do you pick no, uh, investments I'll, in a I'll portfolio? I'll come to my so question. I'll come to my question. There are four things that any of us look at when we invest. He, hear me out. Right? The four... Hear me out. I haven't asked my question yet. I'm, I'm oh, getting okay. it's, it's a bit long-winded, but I'll, I'm, I'm coming to my question. So uh, now, are you also if a, are you also going to come up with a fund where and I did and I know you mentioned your investors have wanted exposure to the pure crypto per se, but me for example. I could invest in a company that uh, comes in with a particular kick-ass product, okay, and then issues uh, coins or tokens, etc., and in which I am lock I've got a lock-in. But I would also much I would much rather purchase uh, the tokens. Many of these many of these wonderful applications. You know, issue these tokens on a on an IDO or a, or an ISO or an IEO, and even if I get it at three times more of a price, I don't mind because these things are moving in decimal places of literally they're moving up three decimal places. So my question to you is, why not give something like that? And now I understand you have regulatory pressures. Okay, and you are constricted to perhaps what you can actually do. But uh, if you can perhaps put together uh, using your entire research pool of analysts and traders and all of these various things, um, a, a fund of sorts where I'm actually purchasing uh, cryptos at a very early stage or you know, different stages in their life cycle. Uh, you know, I personally, as an investor, would be a lot more inst interested in that than, be, than having my friends, uh, than having my funds locked up for a good couple of years and, and not doing anything. I don't mind sacrificing 300% liquidity uh, for things that are anyways moving uh, a couple of decimal points. Yep. Okay, so... A couple of things. I, I, I actually agree with you. And as I said, one of the things we are working on today is should we offer uh, call it actively managed liquid protocol vehicles? You know, one of the challenges, particularly of uh, you mentioned it, the regulatory environment in which we live, you know, the United States, for, for uh, all their infinite wisdom, believes that they need to protect the, uh, the little guy. Uh, or gal. And I, I think actually what the accredited investor standards do is, is quite the opposite. It actually protect, protects the wealthy. It creates a walled garden that keeps everybody out of, of the best opportunities. And so, what, you know, the, the reason you invest in private or venture capital is to capture the illiquidity premium, right? There's only four ways to make money. So you have to take one of four risks. You can take credit risk, buy a bond. You can take equity risk and buy stocks. You can take illiquidity risk and buy private investments that have illiquid uh, uh, restrictions. And then you can use leverage or structure. So in the liquid market, whether it's liquid equities or bonds or, or liquid protocols, certainly great opportunities there. One of the unique elements of digital assets is many of the protocols themselves essentially are liquid venture capital. So they have the same return profile as, as venture capital. Uh, you could lose it all or you could make multiples of your capital, unlike a, a traditional equity or stock, uh, equity or bond investment. So that's why we put 30% of our funds in the liquid protocols. There's a there's a good argument as you made to say let's you know spread that out or, or carve that out and let people invest just in that piece, and I think it's it's a really good idea. So maybe we should do that. All right, Mark. 
Thank you so very much. I uh, appreciate having you with us, albeit uh, not in person. Hope next time uh, we'll be able to, uh, to convince you to come down here and see us in Dubai when we have another show like this. I'm sure you would enjoy seeing the I would, breadth of uh, I would love to be there. I would love to be there live. Let's do it the next time. And uh, by then, we'll, we'll be back to, to circle in the world uh, unrestricted, hopefully. Hopefully. Thank you, Mark. Let's give him Take a hand. Take care, everybody. So that concludes our program for today on stage. Uh, thank you all for coming. We hope to see you again tomorrow. We start at 10 a.m. Um, there will be another long list of speeches and presentations tomorrow, and we welcome you all back. Thank you so much.